Hi everyone, welcome to the Prop Tech panel for October, part of the Spark Festival. We actually have an extraordinarily national panel this month. We've got WA, South Australia, Queensland, Sydney, and we had ACT in Victoria on the line from Stone and Chalk as well before too. My name is Kylie Davis and I'm president and founder of the PropTech Association of Australia. And it's great to see so many of you here today for the PropTech Association's PropTech panel on home ownership and PropTech, which is part of the Spark Festival. And it's great to see so many many people from all over Australia joining us and even from Kuala Lumpur, which is fantastic. I am here on Gadigal land and before I begin in the spirit of reconciliation, the PropTech Association of Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples joining us here today. And I'd especially like to thank our sponsors Stone and Chalk who have made all of these panels possible over the last um, 18 months and for those of you who don't know Stone and Chalk it was founded as a not-for-profit in Sydney in 2015 to help fintech startups commercialize and grow and from the original 40 startups in 2015 it now has over 200 startups in Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide covering all areas of emerging technology including a growing prop tech cohort and there's currently around 30 prop techs that call Stone and Chalk home and they are doing some awesome some work. And I'd also like to thank the PropTech Association of Australia Foundation partners. They are Ashurst Lawyers, Macquarie Bank, PEXA, the Real Estate Institute of WA, Forbury and Web IT List Once. So let's get on with the webinar. Now, residential property is a $9 trillion asset class. It is Australia's favourite and most valuable way of building wealth. But building and owning a home is a lot of work, especially if you want to make improvements, renovate or sell. And in true COVID style, there may be building noise going on in the background of this webinar because my bathroom is being renovated and three houses around me of my neighbours are also being rebuilt right now. So I'll try to keep the noise down. But we see a new era of prop techs, technology businesses that specialize in property that are making life significantly easier for homeowners who want to build or upgrade. And all of our panelists were winners in the first annual prop tech awards held by Prop Tech Association back in May. So you really are meeting some of the very cutting edge and best in market prop tech. Now, our first guest is Tom Young, founder of UDREW, a prop tech which streamlines council planning approvals for standard property updates and makes it faster and easier to create compliant designs based on the latest council regulations. And he's joining us here from Perth. So welcome, Tom. Everyone, and thank you, Carly. It's great to have you on the panel. And next we have Marco Salinas, founder of Hubble, a prop tech that makes it easy to identify the right building materials to use to achieve outcomes such as environmental sustainability or health outcomes and which materials can improve your living experiences. And he's joining us from Adelaide. So welcome, Marco. Hi, Kelly. It's great to have you on the call. And last but certainly not least, we have Trish Mackey Smith, co founder of Indox, a residential property logbook that centralizes all the documentation for your home in one location and makes it easy to hand over at sale time. And Trish is up in sunny Queensland. Hey, Trish. Hi, thanks for having me. We were just saying before the call that this is really COVID will not stop us. We are definitely, I'm here in Sydney, so we've definitely got all the, all the boundaries covered and our Stone and Chalk team backstaging us from both the ACT and Victoria. So look, welcome everyone. It's great to have you on the Prop Tech panel, which is part of our contribution to the Spark Festival. But Tom, let's start off with you because when you're thinking about property journeys, Council approval, like when you're building a home or working on a home, council approval is where everything kind of starts in property. So tell us what the um, problem is that you drew solves and how big a problem that really is. Yeah, maybe I'm being biased. I came from the building industry, so I had, had to deal with a lot of sort of council approval side of things, mainly on the engineering site side, but um, also as someone who has done renovations on my house, it's just systemic. It sucks for the industry and it's really hard for 
homeowners who might not necessarily have that background to even just get through the process. So it's very much inspired by actual events. It affects all of us other, we've all gone through the approval process ourselves or someone very close has, and it's just such a circular and frustrating process for everyone from the industry to homeowners, even for the governments, it's expensive, it's unreliable, and it's very time consuming and subjective. So we are streamlining that whole process and just making it easier and more affordable for everyone. Just for small structures, there's about 800,000 of those um, submitted per annum in Australia, and they take up about 60% of the planning department's time as well. So we're starting in that area to just filter out what we can do and just make it easier, more affordable for everybody. And the market alone for that is for those small structures alone is about 400 million per annum. And that's just for the design process as well. It actually adds up to about 74 billion in total costs. Yep. So we're trying to streamline that whole area. That's they're fantastic numbers. And, and look, and they're amazing numbers and it's a huge market. And I, and it's a stressful market, like not knowing how long something is going to take to like to build a project my background in local media I used to cover council all the time and I've sat through so many council approval meetings where people have ended up either in tears or literally fisticuffs in some instances so it's great to see some improvements happening in, in this area what kind of approvals is you drew streamlining originally it was all focused on engineering and planning and council applications however it turns out that the system we've just designed it that well but oh shucks it also turns out it does business approvals anything that's location centric that requires rules and logic and calculations so the other month we just thought we'd give it a go and we just put in a few different types of approvals and yeah it spits out business approvals straight away it could also potentially do drone permit approvals event planning approvals anything that's tied into location but main focus has always been on the building and planning and the engineering side of things and so is it, so you said before that there's about 60% of council approval, like that are these small scale ones. And they're obviously not like major rebuilds, but fences, pools, like what sort of work? Yeah. So the top 12 small structures are those, like by volume, are those yeah. smaller external additions. So things like carports, pools, fences, and retaining walls, and a few things like that. And so they're the high volume ones and the ones that are often the most circular in process that go back and forward the most, that are the most subjective. And so it's a high pain point, high volume, and that's why we're tackling that area first. And mm -hmm. also the governments have indicated to us that's where they'd like us to start, but do what we're told to. But it's a great sandpit for us to build the foundations to expand upon. So for example, the wind tunneling calculations we do for um, the engineering for a front fence is exactly the same physics as it would be for a 70 story high rise building. So we're able to recycle the logic as we get more complex and into those more higher risk to human life sort of structures. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. So it's awesome that, that you're, that you're working in this space, but what is the, what's happening at the back end? How is you drew solving these problems? There's a lot of steps in that process and it took about 10 years of my personal research um, trying to just nut out each one of these steps how we can streamline it so in the back end it's powered by a few engines that we've developed so we've got a rules engine that learns as every regulation is put in making it quicker for the next region and so it's very scalable this will work anywhere on earth and potentially other planets if um, there's more <laughs> of a market there but when, when we need much. to terraform on Elon for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on Elon, hurry up. So, so so what's the sorry you go Oh, sorry. So that's half of the core engine. The other half is figuring out how to streamline each of these little steps. So how do we calculate the wind? How do we calculate the geotechnical mechanics of a property and do the environmental assessment? So there was about, I think from the top of my head, seven world firsts in the first prototype we had to crack. And it was more of a boring hobby of mine back then. And I just slowly got through them. But yeah, there's a lot happening in the background. But to sum it up, it's rules engine and the logic combined with the science on how we can remotely and accurately calculate all of these site variables. Fantastic. And so what's the impact of Mudru on the workload of council, you know, planners and employees? What's it? 60% sounds like a huge amount that's going to free them up to do much better work. Yes. Yeah. The feedback we've been getting from our collaborators in, in government is it's just, it's got that potential to free up 60% of their time. So they can then focus on say that three-story house that's in a cyclonic wind region on the side of a cliff rather than 
approving 20 pool fences or something like that. So yeah. at first it was received a bit differently and perhaps I wasn't articulating it very well, but they it was almost perceived as a bit threatening to start with. However, as the pilots rolled on, by the end of the pilot, we had, I think, 96% approval rating from the council users who were using the system and they saw it as a tool for what it is. It's to filter out the inquiries, that circular process, the human error upon submission, the meetings, the phone calls, and just all of that sort of additional baggage that comes along. Mm. So once they've got that side, they see, see it as a tool, which is what it is. And it's there to help them make their jobs easier and let them focus on what they're actually interested in doing, smart city design, urban planning. Um, in fact, the, the closest sort of comparison I thought of recently was it's, it's a bit like when CAD was first released to the design world. There was a bit of hesitance and reluctance, but as soon as drafties understood that their eraser supply didn't need to get topped up anymore, that they could quickly just delete something, they could press control Z and undo something, their efficiency just increased a hundredfold. And so they're able to get better return on investment, higher profits and get better records and analysis. So it's comparable in that sense. So what regions are you in at the moment, Tom, and how are you rolling out? Yeah, we have been collaborating in Queensland, New Zealand and WA predominantly. And that's to test the scalability of the sciences working in these different landscapes and different zones. We're also having conversations with the Victorian government and a couple areas in New South Wales. Thank you, Kylie, for the introductions. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and yeah, it's looking really exciting. We're working with primarily larger channel partners and strategic sort of earlier more innovative regions to act as channel partners for us to then service surrounding LGAs or in some cases a whole country with potentially rolling out nationally soon awesome. and um, statewide rollouts as well so we deal with state governments federal and local as well as big um, building industry so big building companies developers tech companies and managed service providers as well right and so is the future of you do in doing more i don't know do you need to upload the the legislation that exists for each council or have you got ways of streamlining even that it's a question yeah, without notice um, so i'm sort of <laughs> throwing it at you <laughs> that's all good hopefully i, I know what i'm answering anyway so yeah, um, I'm talking about. <laughs> the, the rules engine i mentioned earlier it learns so it works in a sort of circular hierarchical fashion and so once we've got Australia-wide rules, then it will know this jurisdiction, which might be a state, then it might get to an individual local government, and then it could even go to deeper to developers. And what the rule engine, rules engine does is it learns, it goes through all that, circles back up, and it will always produce the correct result. So it's really quick and easy to input any rule with any outcome under any condition in any area. Yeah, it's not too bad actually. And yeah, it took a while to design that beast, but. <laughs> I, I bet. I look, I'm, I look, I'm all for the nerds, passion projects turning into major businesses. I think it's <laughs> awesome. So how far, how big are you now, Tom? Like what's your plans for world domination? I've put on a lot of weight since I joined the tech world, <laughs> if that's what you're asking. We are 13 staff at the moment and looking to get a couple more on board very soon. We're working directly with channel partners. So that reduces the need for marketing and also servicing and things like that. So we've got our core team, which is comprised of niche experts in every area. We've actually got the um, former CTO of Oracle as our head of software. And he's also a former CTO of Symantec too. So our cybersecurity has got to be right up there. We've got okay. the best structural engineer in WA, possibly Australia, but maybe I'm biased. And we've got architects, a planner, and then we've got niche tech areas. So everyone, every little pocket is covered. And it was quite challenging at the start of the journey, trying to marry the hardcore building industry with the hardcore tech world. But yeah, I've got a fantastic team and really happy with that. And hello to Cynthia, because I think you're watching. So. <laughs> hey, big shout out. And so how far away, because you mentioned before that the engineering that goes or the wind tunnel engineering that goes into a suburban fence is the same engineering thinking that goes into a 17 story building. How far away are you from doing bigger projects or bigger? So it's not just that uh, those smaller projects, but it starts to get bigger. Yeah, the whole system's designed as a true platform. So it's just a bunch of microservices that just click all on together. So a module that's, I think it's coming out in the next week or two called the marketplace module allows any structure to be brought into the system. So engineers, architects, builders, suppliers can bring in anything into the system and still get that streamlined process. So 
we're not generating the the end to end for that, but it's still getting full advantage of the digitized process and all the council checks and all of that stuff. But if you want to bring your own engineer, you bring your own engineer and you can, you do, you do the certification rather than us doing it. So it's very malleable, very flexible. And so in effect, we could do any structure, bring in the design, we can do all the checks and all the engineering double checks and submission and all of that. But with the larger structures, um, we're getting onto granny flats at the moment, um, and modular design, and that'll incrementally, um, expand pretty quickly. And the end goal is to be able to do a hundred story high rises if we want to, or an airport or a bridge, it doesn't really matter, but we will get onto it and starting with a small high volume pain in the ass stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Look, I can't wait to the days when council can actually focus on the community building stuff rather than all the, all the bureaucratic admin that goes into worrying about fences and post off, post boxes and things like that. So well done. Thank so you. Marco Salinas from Hubble, let's move on to you now because once I've got my approvals from council, then I need to start to really, well, maybe as part of this process, I've chosen materials to achieve the design that I want and the look and the feel that I want, but also the outcomes that I've stated in my application. So tell me, I love your technology. Tell me how Hubble works. Thank you, Kelly. And definitely you should be using Hubble. And hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for having me as part of your panel and as part of the Spark Festival. I'm very excited to be here, sharing this space with Tom and Trish. Awesome. So tell me how Hubble works, um, Marco. Perhaps before I jump into how it works, perhaps I should be explaining why are we okay. doing what we do. And we, are, we want to transition every single home into a more healthy, net zero, comfortable environment. And Hubble technically what is, is a platform that helps you understand what's happening at your place, at your home, and we can explain you, identify the benefits of green solutions. Like for example, if you are planning on double glaze in your house, then what could be the potential benefit in a very simple way? So like for example, what could be the potential temperature, what's level of comfort, energy savings, carbon footprint, and, and things that anyone can understand. Or perhaps you would like to experience other, other experiences, like for example, allergy-free environments for your house. So how important is material selection in achieving a livable outcome for your home? Because at the moment we tend to just choose, having just been through a renovation, you go for the look that you're looking for, and then you choose based on the price you can afford. And then it's kind of, that's I would say it's, it's fundamental. The theory that we adopted at, at Hobel is that a healthy living sustainable environments, they, it's composed of three different pillars, being the first one being the building science, the design, the materials that you use. Then the second pillar, the way in which we see it is the smart energy, clean energy. And then the, the last one, perhaps even in the same way important, the social and human behavior. And the material selection goes to that first pillar alongside with the design. And at the end of the day, we would like to see, or you would like to see as your home, uh, very uh, strong, long lasting materials that will provide a very healthy and safe environment to yourself and, and to your family. And it's fundamental given that these materials alongside with the design will impact significantly on how do you feel the temperature or how well ventilated the space is. Like many people perhaps can, uh, I don't know, I, I was having a, a chat with the, the, the CSRO staff and they were, we were discussing how having really well ventilated environments is many people might have like headaches at night and, and they might be attributing this to something else, like perhaps to work or a health condition, but they don't know that it's perhaps even because of the, the environment and, and, and the selection and the design of the house. And that's where we try and trying to make it. So what sort of outcomes can I aspire to achieve if I'm using Hubble environment, health, are there heating, warmth, what else? What else? Well, I would say like the, the, perhaps the most important one is to understand what's happening. Like the way in which, like I always I like to pitch Hubble is more like an ed educational type of software where first of all, we're trying to show you what's happening at your home. So you can get a, perhaps a better feeling an understanding of the different things that you might have to consider to have a healthy environment. And of course, once you have perhaps that idea, then the, the outcome would be to improve it. 
So then we tell you recommendations or suggestions on how to improve it. So you don't have to be an expert in this topic to actually go and take your home to the next level. And ultimately, we would like to introduce you to the service providers or the materials that are making a difference in this industry. So they, they can just go immediately and they start applying these concepts to your home. Awesome. So I love that you're also doing the introduction as well. Who's your main client base? Is it those material providers or who are your clients? We, we just started. We spun out last year from a mid-sized company in the consultancy sector for energy efficiency. We're moving very fast. Since then, we were able to help build 10 Star House here in Adelaide, perhaps the most energy efficient house in, in the planet. Wow. Uh, then we release a beta version of our software to architects. And, builder and builders. A few of our clients are builders in Northern Territory. We're currently prospecting a, a really important builder in Western Australia, in Adelaide. And we recently won a feasibility study with government so we can take our technology to social housing. So then the most vulnerable communities can take advantage of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Ultimately, the ones that we're helping the most right now are those companies that are promoting healthy living with materials. And we got a few clients. And we started with what we consider perhaps the most difficult to explain, which is glazing uh, and windows. We are working with a few uh, windows companies here in South Australia. To give you an example, uh, one of them is Australian Window Solutions, which we are partnering with. We are also in partnering with in ACT and Victoria with Ultimate Windows that they are being featured in a TV show and Channel 9 at the moment and, and a few other providers. We are also looking into home automation with, with a few partners, air tightness as well. So the, the idea is to show and explain what different components you should be like thinking of when you are planning on even about, uh, you're planning on buying a house or renovating or building a new house from scratch. So, so I, I love this idea because I didn't know you could actually have a house that was 10 stars. I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I figured five might be the max, but it, it's great that you're, you're going for 10. What, what's happening at the back end of Hubble to make all of this possible? We use, first of all, the team, which is perhaps amazing, a team composed of experts in energy efficiency. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to get their knowledge and trying to make it digital. And we're taking mm -hmm. it to, to a, a digital, digital interactive tool with the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So technically what we do, we use millions of previous record of energy efficiency assessments. And what we're trying to do is to estimate really quick without having or without having to be an expert. And we are giving you a very close estimate on how your house performs in order to provide an advice on how to improve it. Awesome. Awesome. So I think, so Marco, I think you and Tom need to get together so that anything that's built with using the Hubble. And, and, and to, be, to be honest, actually, we really did. Oh, uh, good. Uh, we had a <laughs> catch up yesterday. And yeah, we're really planning, we were talking about APIs and, you know, how to integrate systems. I, I love it. So how old is Hubble? How big are you? Give us a little bit of um, background on the size of the business. We just started last year, July, midway of the pandemic with all the challenges that this throws. It has been an amazing experience. We're moving very fast. The team is still small. We, the, we only got uh, one intern, but the team is amazing. Uh, very high caliber in terms of technology and data science. 10 or 15 years in exper of experience in energy efficiency and building design. And my co-founder, Jim, he sits in different boards in, in the residential industry. And yeah, I can't wait for what, 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 what the future is, where is, is, having, is going for us. Oh, that sounds awesome. So look, tell me, I love this story, but tell me why your prop tech is called Hubble. It, it started with a very perhaps famous uh, astronomer. That's actually his last name. He contributed to one of the uh, most important telescopes. And energy efficiency is, is measured in stars. When we started thinking on Hubble, we, we envisioned a tool that helps you find more stars or a star of eight points. Energy efficiency goes in a rating from one to 10 here in Australia. And we consider that people should be targeting eight, eight stars. That should be the goal or a little bit more than eight stars in such a way that it's, it's feasible from an economic way, but at the same time, they're contributing to climate change, healthy living. That's the reason why our logo is a telescope 
and having a star of points in the middle. I love it because we all know, we've all heard of the Hubble telescope. So Hubble, the prop tech is actually showing you how to turn your house into, into 10 stars or how to find more stars for your house. And so a typical house, a typical Australian house, how many stars do you reckon that is currently on average? I can tell you that until recent, the minimum standard, and mostly this is being driven by regulation, and mm -hmm. perhaps this is one of the biggest issues, it has been six star. And until this year, next year will be going, we will increase into seven. Minimum standard will be increasing to seven stars. I we still believe that is not enough. People should be looking at eight stars. And the reason yeah. we are, actually, we can say this, we conducted a research and we found that all the benefits, you start getting benefits when you reach seven stars. So anything below seven star, you are, it's still perhaps considered uncomfortable and, and waste to the environment and the energy consumption. So anyone that is, perhaps that could be the takeaway. If you're planning on renovating or building a new house and you would like to know what should be targeting, that should be eight stars. It should be eight stars. And, but if you're in an older home, it's probably going to be let, like, so that seven star rating that people are going for at the moment, that's for new builds, right? That's yeah, green in the case of stuff. renovation, it's yes, it, it, it's perhaps even worse. We can say that I, I wouldn't perhaps like would like to say a number, but yeah, it's very low, like below the five the five star, and all depends on when when the house was built, the conditions of the house, how well ventilated. I would say I have seen studies that they they show that many regions are between one and two stars, mostly are below five stars, which is yes, it is perhaps not good and. And people need to be aware of this. And I would say that there are still a few builders that they would like to keep energy efficiency under the hat. And they don't want to even share it. If you're building a house, you should be approaching your builder and be asking, you know, like, why is this six star or six, uh, how can I improve it? What that means? Because when, and perhaps that is another what the problem is that we're trying to tackle. Like what the star rating actually means. Like, how much this will impact on my, uh, on my bill or in my comfort. And this is the kind of things that we can explain very well with Hubble. Awesome. Awesome. So Trish Mackie Smith from Indox. Now, before I come to you, I just want to let everybody know if anyone's got any questions, please pop them into the chat. Cause we're, we're going to start open up our, our questions after we've chatted to Trish. Trish, let's talk to you now because approvals and specialized materials and the outcomes of those materials these are all elements that need to be captured as part of any handover between the property owner selling their property to the next owner so aren't they <laughs> oh yes absolutely <laughs> critical yes and so tell me how does indox work yeah it is critical uh, to have all this information at hand throughout the entire property's life cycle really. And for example, when you go to renovate, you would need to refer to plans. You went to repair, you would need to look at the specifications, the paint colors and other building materials. And when you go to sell, very important to have as much information available and that will help the sales process. So what Indox does, it generates digital logbooks for your property. It's a cloud-based management system. Uh, to manage everything about your home throughout its life cycle. And what it does for homeowners, homeowners are extremely busy mm -hmm. and they own million dollar plus properties and they're not managing them properly. They don't have time. They're very time poor. So what we do at Indox, we create digital logbooks. We capture the data at the very beginning from the property developer or builder package it all up nicely so that it gets handed over in a useful way for the property owner. So they get an app with all that information at hand instead of going into the kitchen drawer or a USB stick or even customer portals. This is much more useful for the owner to actually um, maintain their property and uh, they get the warranty alerts, maintenance alerts, all the contacts, uh, plumbers, electricians, and so forth. So it really helps them manage their property. Everything is accessible on their phone. Yeah, awesome. Because I'm at, look, I am very guilty of having the, the junk drawer in the kitchen, which did get a big tidy up during COVID and some astonishing <laughs> things right. were found in that from 20 years of property ownership, let me tell you. But also having owned a property that was at, in the fire zones during the bushfires a couple of years ago, mm. like some of this 
information tends to get spread out everywhere, doesn't it? So if I've got the Indox app once I'm using, am I able to add to it as things come up? Does it become like a virtual third drawer from the <laughs> in the kitchen? Absolutely. That's what it's all about. It creates a digital asset for the property. And in some respects, it could be more valuable than the physical asset, especially if there is a fire or flood, you can access all that information because it's all stored in the cloud yep. and it helps with insurance claims. You can prove yep. what was there before and rebuild because the plans are there. And so it certainly ensures peace of mind for the property owner. Okay. So how does it improve? Is it possible for having a logbook correctly updated and managed in the same way that if you've got a car that you've got a good logbook for it actually improves the value of the car when it comes to resale does it improve the value of the property longer term of course yes it would make a huge difference and we've even seen that with um, some of our users they've told us stories of being able to provide this logbook at sale time to the next owner and they've been offered a hundred grand more than um, what they were expecting because they stood out, their property stood out. It definitely adds value to the property. There's no doubt, like a logbook for a car. I use that analogy all the time. Would you buy a car without a logbook? You wouldn't. And I, why shouldn't the same be applied to, to homes? And it's very easy to add to that logbook, very easy to drag and drop. And you can easily scan using your mobile phone straight into your Indoc. Very easy to keep adding to it and main, maintaining it. You can relax and know that those alerts will come through when the warranty is about to expire on your fridge or things like that. So it just makes um, your living a lot more free. It sounds like a really stress-free way to be a grown-up adulting, the adulting <laughs> of property ownership, which is... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I can say firsthand it's really hard work. And also I remember during the bushfires, my mum rushing out of the house with a great big couple of files of insurance papers and things that she should have shoved in the cut, like a plastic box full of stuff that she thought were necessary yeah. for, to save just in case That's we came back. Stuff. Happily the house was still there when we came back, but touch and go. Yeah. Um, so is it just the digital assets that you're collecting? Can you, how do you collect analog assets for, or for buildings that aren't new because I or just tell me how you're rolling out because you're, you're focusing mainly on new buildings at the moment but how does it work for existing yeah good question we have been working more closely with developers and builders to help them with packaging up all that handover information so that's where we've started but we have been also working with real estate agents and uh, building inspectors and they are collating this information. And so when the when they do their report, they provide a logbook on INDOC. It's very, most houses, if it, it's existing, it, there would be some information. A very old house, a hundred year old house might have four or five files that you might be able to find, but you can easily start with that and yep. uh, scan it with using your mobile phone. It's better to have something than nothing in case there is a flood or a cyclone or something, but very easy to do. We make it simple and yeah, and even with heritage buildings in some jurisdictions, you must by law have a logbook. A lot of people right. aren't aware of that. Wow. So, um, so yeah, this is the way of the future. Yeah, that's what I think anyway. Yeah. And so how big is Indox? How, how big are you guys? How long have you been around for? Yeah, we launched in 2018 and uh, we've now got property developers and builders all around Australia. We have over 2,000, I think it's 2,500 property owners and we've just started marketing in the UK as well. So oh. we're doing some market testing there. Yeah, yeah, we're growing quite rapidly and uh, very exciting. Awesome. And so how long, like if anyone's watching today as part of the Spark Festival and they're like, I want an index for my home, <laughs> yeah. um, but they're, but you're not a developer. How do, is it possible to, uh, to use it yet or is it? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, We've awesome. had lots of property owners actually contact us because they've seen these podcasts like this one and web webinars and articles that we've written. They've come to us and asked um, if they could set up their own logbook. And they've actually been able to do it very easily. We've got video onboarding. It's so easy to use. And it's only $19 a month for up to 10 properties. So if you're an investor, you can 
use Indox instead of paying a property manager, you can very easily use Indox. I think it'd be great for asset depreciation and stuff like that too, I imagine. if you've got... Absolutely, because you can easily share all that information with your accountant or your solicitor. It's, yeah, it's very easy to use. And this is, we want to get that message out there. Awesome. Awesome. So look, thanks everybody for that, for those fantastic overviews on your prop tech. So I'm, and I can see how beautifully they all flow together too. So I'm looking forward to the, a day one day soon in the future where I've got my approvals. I've got an amazing design that's completely environmentally friendly and making my house beautiful to live in. And then I'm sharing all of that information through Indoc so that I'm capturing it all in one spot. But how yeah. open are you guys finding your customer, how open are you to property owners to prop tech solutions like the ones that you're offering and how are you building awareness of it? Who wants to go first? Tom? Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, we're very open to it and we love hearing from property owners about how we can help. Initially, it was a bit harder. It took until about 2018 and before then I'd be laughed out of about nine out of 10 meetings, just people telling me it's too hard. It's not going to work, even despite the fact I would design something in front of them and it would generate all the drawings. So it was just too much too quickly to start yeah. with. But I find that COVID, um, as horrible as it's been, has really um, accelerated the digital open-mindedness, I suppose, yeah. if that's even a word. And people are now embracing it much more than they would have before. Mm -hmm. So as far as making people aware of what we're doing, we've been a startup most of our journey and very low budget. So We've been reliant on word of mouth and innovators from certain companies who get it and support us and help us get the vision out there. And yeah, that's mainly what we've been doing. And we work with channel partners as well, who then get it out to the broader community, such as local councils embedding it directly in their system or suppliers who might have a white label version on their website to help someone pick products from their catalog and incorporate it into the design and generate things from that to engineers who use it for other purposes. And yeah, there's lots of other little uses and cool channel awesome. partners we're working with. Awesome. And Marco, if people are curious about Hubble and they're looking to use it, how do they, how, how what kind of interest have you had? I will say the, the interest has been fantastic. We receive a huge pull from suppliers, vendors, retailers, and yes, in the case you're renovating, anyone feel free to reach out. We are still not targeting homeowners as yet because we're still validating our user experience and perhaps our tool is still a little bit too technical, but we have been helping people that they hear about how old they come and uh, they're doing a renovation, a new build. And most of the times we're happy to help them. In our case, and perhaps Pia is, is from, from my team, perhaps he, she's listening. She will know that from now on then we get a request and we the team actually gets this feeling of trying to help and suggest different things that they can do and happy to continue doing that. However, our main target right now, and perhaps this is more from a, a strategy perspective, we are helping more businesses explain the benefits of their products. And, and that's perhaps where Hubble sits right now. We are helping Windows companies, particularly. We are also helping home, smart home automation companies. We are helping companies providing other services. And if any other company that things that they have a product or service with a high impact in comfort or energy efficiency or in the experience of the house, more than happy to start like helping them convey the correct messages to their customers. Awesome. And so look, all three of you guys are quite a young prop techs and you're scaling quite quickly. What have your biggest challenges been to date? What, what's your biggest challenge been, Trish? I think it's getting the market fit for our messaging is a challenge, what has been, and yeah, educating the public about why they need a logbook. A property logbook is something that's, it's a concept that's known in the UK and mm -hmm. the USA, but it's very new in Australia. So just, yeah, educating and getting the message out there of the benefits of, of having a property logbook. That's been a major challenge, but I think we're yeah, we're starting to get it right. So how, so how is Indox different to just say a shared drive, like uploading everything to a shared drive? It's interactive and it, it um, automates alerts for warranties, for example, yep. and maintenance and plus has all the contacts in there. So you might get a, for example, a reminder for a termite inspection, and then it has the tradesperson there that you just click on to book it in. 
So it's all, it's very different to a Dropbox or oh, anything else out there. Got it. Got it. And look, Tom, we've actually had a follow-up question based on your answer and your comment about being laughed out of the room. What's <laughs> been the biggest blocker that each of you guys have experienced in discussing the opportunities with large industry partners? Has it been a lack of interest? Has it been lack of understanding or lack of innovative mindset what's the what's been the biggest blocker with industry partners yeah Marco, i'd say it's yep. risk aversion oh yeah. sorry <laughs> there you go. no there you go Marco, do you want to go <laughs> <laughs> sorry to interrupt but i'd definitely say it's the uh, risk aversion and it's a classic sort of um startup um catch 22s or multiple catch 22s you need the validation to prove out the innovation, but no one's willing to be the first. You can't get funding until you've got a client. You can't get a client until you've got a product. You can't get a product until you get a client. It's just a big bloody circular contradiction. And I guess that was my biggest challenge is it's the seesaw of, you know, build out product and then have to get to this point, get the client on board, get the funding and it just going around. And so getting the first few um, pilots started was definitely the hardest because we came in there with zero track record saying we could do something that most people thought was impossible and too challenging and so it's that general risk aversion of everyone wants innovation but no one wants to be the first everyone wants everything to be fixed but no one wants to change change makers yeah, yeah. Uh, marco what about you what have you experienced what has your been your biggest blocker there have been a few i would say perhaps the, the first one that brought a little bit of adversity was the pandemic of course the whole started midway of the pandemic with a lot of uncertainty with that provided a different environment to the actual startups if it's even difficult as a regular step but just just imagine midway the, the pandemic. So uh, I would say that, that, is, that is one. The second one, I would say perhaps the, the response time. And that is something that I was discussing yesterday with Tom. When we approach a big organization, usually the sales cycle is, is very, is quite lengthy slow. and very slow. And as a startup, many times you don't have the time to, you, you're expecting a, a really quick response. They, you're expecting uh, a really good early adopter that understands your stage and wants to move very quick with you. And that's the idea. Uh, and something that I found, and this is perhaps more particularly to South Australia, is that the, the South Australian market usually is not a very good early adopter, like when the, in terms of technology. So most of our first pilots, they, they happen with companies interstate, like in Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia. And it was very difficult to uh, penetrate the South Australian market, even though it's very local and we know the, the industry, but yes, there, there is this a little bit of resistance, which by the way, in the other side is quite good because once you understand and you know how to penetrate the South Australian market, that's a, a huge milestone that you can replicate in other states. <laughs> it has its uh, concern and pros at the same time. Awesome. Now, look, just to wrap up, final question for everybody, because I'm sure we could talk about this all day, but if there was one person or one contact you could make as a result of being part of this panel today that could radically change your business, who would that be or, or what type of person would that be? Tom, I'm going to kick off with you. I hate being the first to answer the question, but no, that's all right. Um, look, <laughs> there's not one specific person but any senior government officials would be fantastic any big developers big builders or just innovative people that want to make a difference i'd just love to talk to anybody um and learn from them where i can so it's not really just client related it's also just because i'm a total tech nerd and i love cool things related but yeah yeah there's just so many people i'd love to meet and what about you trish in art cave in oh, west sorry. australia it's a bit hard sometimes so no, so that's all right but look now that the covid's happened we all know how to use qr codes we all know how to use zoom yeah holes opened up for us what about yeah. you for me the ideal person would be the decision maker of a major insurer yeah because <laughs> i think it or a bank because i think it's a definitely a hand in glove fit for someone an insurer or a bank um, to have a logbook available for their customers. If it's an organisation with a few million who can offer a value add to their customers and stay relevant for the whole life of the property, come and talk to me. We'd love to have a chat. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and what about you, Marco? Who would you like to connect up with? Any architect or builder, but those that they are trying to make a difference and, and improve and, and build healthy homes like they want 
Anyone trying to build something amazing definitely should be contacting us. Anyone with solutions with high impact in energy efficiency, it could be a Windows company or it could be anything, you know, it could be a roof or a different type of wall. We would like to hear from you. Awesome. Awesome. Look, thank you everybody for your contributions today. It's been a fantastic panel. Thank you, Tom Young from Udru, Trish Mackey-Smith from Indox and Marco from um, Salinas from Hubble. I'd like to also thank Stone and Chalk, our sponsors for today. And thanks to my fellow members of the PropTech Association. It's been great to have everyone on the panel today and, and have a great Spark Festival, anyone. I hope you've um, got some great information and insights out of um, how PropTech is helping homeowners don't hesitate to reach out to these guys via their websites or to if you need help getting hold of them reach out to me at the prop tech association and we will book you up especially if you know anyone who is one of their ideal contacts that they'd like to connect up with so thanks very much for everybody for your time today thanks for a great panel we'll see you next month and uh, keep on prop teching thanks <laughs>